How should a sermon begin? First, we'll have to acknowledge that a good beginning does not guarantee that a sermon will be a success. But we do know that a bad beginning can make a sermon an utter failure. <laughs> Consider some examples. During my colonoscopy procedure last month, <laughs> or while driving to church today, I felt the Holy Spirit telling me to toss out the sermon I wrote for you last night and try something brand new. Or here at the wedding of Joe and Maria, let us remember the words of our Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2. <laughs> or maybe, wow, the twins really do have a hard time with the Yankees, don't they? <laughs> Too soon, I'm sorry. <laughs> the point is, if you fail to hook them at the beginning, you just might lose them. Jesus, fortunately, appeared not to have such problems. He nailed that part of preaching 101. Blessed are the poor in spirit. These are the first words he has to say to us. At least in Matthew's account, they're the first extensive public statements that we hear. Jesus, the teacher Messiah of Matthew, begins his career with the Sermon on the Mount. The whole sermon is his inaugural address. It's where he chooses to begin. And we can learn a lot about a person's character, a lot about their priorities by what they say first. Someone who doesn't know where they're going will make that clear pretty immediately, in my experience. But somebody who has a destination in mind will point the way. And so with his opening lines to the assembled crowd of students, Jesus announces boldly that things are going to be different now. His tender words about who is blessed, they aren't fluffy folk wisdom. He's not wishing that people who struggle might discover a better life or become more optimistic. He's announcing that it will not be business as usual anymore. Not with him, and certainly not with his followers, not with this kingdom of heaven thing that he's come to bring about. We should take note that Jesus begins with poetry. He doesn't introduce himself and his good news with soaring, complex theological principles. He doesn't show up with explanations, not even, spiritual, not even scriptural proofs, certainly not threats, no leadership principles, no flashy miracles or exorcisms just to break the ice. He doesn't make a lot of noise at the beginning. His poetry pulls you in. And there's this riveting rhythm to his words, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will be comforted, for they will inherit the earth, for they will receive mercy, for they will see God. My guess is that he starts out quietly instead of shouting. He makes us lean in a little bit closer to make sure we're really hearing what he's saying. And I'll bet it sounds a little bit choppy at first, but then a rhythm starts to emerge in his words and he gains energy. What starts off as strange and really disruptive, if not ridiculous, suddenly starts to be sound normal. Before you know it, the repetition, then the cadence, it means emphasis. Before you know it, the pattern of blessed they, blessed they, blessed they becomes a rallying cry creates an overture that will introduce Jesus and his ministry. And that rhythm of his full-blown establishes a sense of promise. The poor in spirit will receive, the meek will receive, the merciful will receive. He begins with poetry, but he begins with promise. And the promise, it's not wishful thinking, it establishes a new reliability. The promises, they're declarations of who Jesus has come to help. They aren't good luck charms. These are, not, these are announcements. Announcements of where the Lord will be, for who he will be with. He says, this is where you all can find me from this point forward. But it's a message we push away all too often, isn't it? It's a message that calls pray to our desire to make Jesus into the Messiah who has come to establish good manners. That desire ruins this passage when we make these claims into ethical instructions. Be nice. Take turns. Live more humbly. Remember, only the gentle people can have God's gifts. 
There are other mistakes. And a second one will hijack the poetry in even worse ways. This is when we pretend that Jesus is somehow redefining what true contentment really is. That he's telling people their suffering is good for them if only they could just see it. You're the people who suffer, so we don't have to. Thank you for your service. Meanwhile, we'll strive for more and protect ourselves. If you need a closer look at the diseases that afflict the body of Christ that we heard about from this pulpit yesterday, look no further. That attitude is one of the leprosies of American mainline Christianity. But no, Jesus is doing something really different here. He's making declarations that are our mission statement. This is where I'll be, bringing blessing where no one expected to find it. Jesus' presence in the world, beginning now, begins that some people are blessed. But what in the world does blessed mean anyway? It's a hashtag, which means its meaning has probably been lost forever. <laughs> it's a churchy word, which means we say it a lot in congregations. People in the pews will all nod when we say it, but nobody dares raise their hand to ask what it means. I mentioned that he's not dispensing good luck charms with these words. He's not saying, I really hope God takes care of you. This is a different kind of thing than, say, the blessing of the animals that took place in some communities last Friday on St. Francis' feast day. I've never blessed animals, so I admit I'm kind of out of my element here. Uh, my son did tell me once that he baptized our dog when he was a puppy. <laughs> I imagine, may your kibble be fresh and don't bite the mail carrier, right? <laughs> don't pee in the narthex on your way out. Or for my dog, it would really be a way of exercising pastoral control and saying, please stop eating trash out of the, out of the kitchen trash can. But the wording in the form of this part of the Sermon on the Mount is different. Something else is going on here. A better translation than blessed could be satisfied. It has the sense of unburdened, happy in some translations, in a contented way, at peace. It means that you've been seen. It means that your needs are met. Of course, then what becomes jarring is the groups that he's talking about, the poor in spirit, the persecuted, all of the others, he says he will bring satisfaction and peace to the very people who seem almost certain to lack those things. So what's going on then? How can the people that Jesus is talking about, those who seem to lack so much power and prestige and comfort and agency according to our conventional standards, how can they possibly enjoy the benefits and the fullness that come from God? Well, Jesus says they do. You, he says, the poor in spirit, I see you. He's talking to people who are broken, people who have been robbed of their spirit, robbed of their liveliness. You know, the people whose eyes never leave the floor when they speak to you. People whose instincts have been radically rewired. They can never get past self-questioning. People who have given up on a sense of their own worth. Those of you who mourn, he says, I see you too. Those of you who suffer grief and loss on a continual basis and you live with the emptiness that never goes away. People who have been deprived of joy, people who have lost a spouse or a child. Those of you who lost a job you loved and is never coming back. Anybody robbed of their innocence or robbed of their physical health People who have lost homes and been denied the opportunity to settle, to really settle into new ones. Jesus says, against all odds, you will know peace. The meek, he says, the people who get stepped on, the ones with no legal representation, the people who don't count and who don't get counted. Jesus will make them blessed, unburdened. He will go to those who have no power over others, those who refuse to exploit others to get what they want. These are the people who have been told they have to stay docile. They'll get classified as the enemy. But Jesus will make them satisfied. Jesus will raise them up. The earth will belong to the meek. Those who hunger, those who thirst for righteousness. These aren't the moral reformers. These aren't the folks trying to shut down the local liquor store. These are the victims of injustice. 
These are the people who ask you to remember the names of their children because those children were cut down and cut off. And the names and the memories are all that are left. These are the people who get blamed for everything. But if Jesus is to be trusted, they will hunger and thirst no more. He will make them full. He sees peacemakers, not the people who put their names on petitions or who pass policy resolutions in the safety of a conference room, but the people who put themselves directly in harm's way. The people who stand between warring groups, whether those groups are nations or neighborhoods or members of a war-torn family. Peacemakers intervene. They put their careers and their reputations on the line to oppose injustice and violence. They surrender privilege. They're the people who provide tangible sanctuary for those who have targets on their backs. People who would do whatever it takes to protect the powerless. Jesus has come for them and to be seen in them. Even the persecuted will be relieved of their burdens. The people who have their dignity or their wholeness denied or stripped away from them. The people who are shunned because they're not productive enough. The people whose quests for truth and equity earn them rebukes and doors shut in their face. Jesus said, I came for you. And so right here, right at the opening of his ministry, right in his first big speech, Jesus announces his intentions for the kind of people who stay out or who are kept out of public view, the kinds of people who suffer as a chronic condition, the kinds of people who are taken advantage of by strangers as well as friends, the people who are made to feel like objects and not subjects. Jesus says, I am going to invert all of your taken-for-granted expectations about where happiness and where achievement can be found. It won't come from success. It won't come from winning. It simply will come from being where I am. He's putting an end to the lie that some people simply have to be expendable. You'll never discover where Jesus is hanging out if you aren't willing to try thinking differently from how you've been taught. It doesn't seem to make sense. Blessed, happy are the scapegoats. They will receive honor. Blessed, satisfied are those who aren't believed when they tell stories of abuse that they have suffered. For they will be the ones who get to write the laws for a new generation. Blessed, unburdened are the uninsured. They will experience abundant life and health. Blessed, at peace are the forgotten. Because they, well, they, they are Christ. Blessed, unburdened also are preachers and congregations who discover where Jesus is. Right where he said he would be. Some of you maybe have visited the Mount of the Beatitudes, which oversees the Sea of Galilee. If you've been there, you know it's beautiful. It's a hill. And on top is this lovely 20th century Roman Catholic church. It's surrounded by gardens and by vistas where you can sit and take in the fresh air and look out over the lake. And the church is dedicated to these precise words, to Jesus' promises of blessing. And the landscape and the architecture have all of these reminders, all of these prompts to get you to reflect on his words. If anybody gets too loud, the sisters who tend the place will come and shush you in 12 different languages. <laughs> it's just a great spot for peaceful and quiet contemplation. The problem with it, in my mind, is it doesn't really fit these words. It doesn't feel quite right for what Jesus is trying to accomplish. These words should take our minds, they should take our whole selves to less comfortable places, to less safe places. The kingdom of heaven that he came to talk about, the place, the thing he came to embody by word and by action, it's about the arrival of a whole new reality. He's talking about a new society here, one that we can't yet see because we've been taught that it just is too good to be true. That all this talk about health and wholeness and forgiveness and being remembered, isn't that just religious escapism? No, the kingdom of God breaks in here, right here in human society. Its lifeblood is a protest against the status quo. It stands against our ugliest inclinations as human beings. It, are, it incarnates itself in real flesh and blood right here. God's kingdom is a way of being that seems impossible to us because we're bombarded day after day by messages that say, 
Blessed are those who protect their strength. Blessed are those who protect what belongs to them at all costs, who cast aside the losers. Blessed are those who make sure the first stay first and the last stay last. That's why he has to begin the sermon with poetry. He's trying to stir your imagination to see something you haven't seen before. Like any good poet, he wants you to see differently. He wants you to start over. He wants you to find a new beginning. That kind of sounds like favoritism, doesn't it? This whole thing. Does he really privilege the meek and the persecuted? Well, yeah, he does. <laughs> but isn't Jesus among everyone? Can't he bring satisfaction to everyone? Yes, he can. But we have to read different passages to see what Jesus has to say to those who are, who are already relatively powerful or comfortable. The point to notice now, here at the beginning, is that he doesn't start there. Instead, the kingdom of God begins at the bottom. Or at least it begins at the places we've been told to call the bottom. But preachers, where does it all begin with you? Where did Jesus call you? To whom did he call you? Where have you found him? Where do, we be where do we begin? It's a key question for constructing a sermon. As you stare at that blank screen with the cursor flashing at you, taunting you. But it's also a vital question for anyone who wants to preach the good news and think about how they got here. Preachers, remember your own callings. I'll wager you didn't first discover Jesus dwelling in ideas. I'll wager you first discovered him in the actual people that you know, or people you can know. Jesus is calling you to encounter him in them. I don't know about you, but today I hear a lot of people saying, where do we even begin right now? Where do we begin when churches are closing and congregations are way too anxious about their numbers? Where do we begin when the polarization in our nation makes me, at least, so furious at so many other Christians? Where do we begin when the church is discovering more and more of its ingrained faults and the extent of the damage that we have done through our historic sins faster than we can repent of all of them? Where do we begin to proclaim God's new society when it seems so strange and so far away? Friends, we begin at the beginning. We begin where the kingdom of heaven starts, at the foundations. Begin where Jesus begins his sermon. Follow his promises. Follow the poetry to find him and to find his gifts. Show mercy to those who have been denied it. Open doors to those who have been walled off. Begin by insisting that this new reality called the kingdom of heaven has indeed come near. It's right behind you at the door. And so here today we gather on this side of the door as we do so many days. We do this for good reason. We do this to remind one another that we can see it sometimes, this kingdom. And on the days that we can't see it very clearly, we pray just as Jesus will teach in the same sermon. Lord, thy kingdom come. Pay attention to your own poetic acts. We taste that new upside-down kingdom around a table. Some Sundays we splash it all over kids and maybe even sometimes an adult down here at the waters. We do that stuff here with all of the poetic imagination, all of the imagery, all of the nearly ridiculous claims that we make about death to life, banquets and betrayal. We do it all right here so that we might show that kingdom to others who are just beyond the doors. We do this week after week after week after week. We don't stop. We begin over and over if we have to. But we keep doing it until those actions and those words coalesce into a beat that just won't get out of our head. Until we hear a rhythm that sticks and patterns us into new ways of interpreting and engaging our world. And that rhythm, it persists and sometimes it resists until at last it breaks forth into an unburdened kind of symphony. Jesus Christ, look what you started. 
Rejoice, church, and be glad.